<laughs> well, good morning everybody. I'm up with Mandy at the prayer log. Uh, and we're going to do something a bit different in the um, home groups this week. We're going to continue to look at the parallels between Exodus and Revelation 16 with the plagues and what the Lord is going to be doing with his people during this time. And it's going to be quite a lot of homework for you guys in terms of digging up scripture. We'll come to that in a bit. But before we do, um, some announcements. So, Passover um, really this year correlates up with um, what we call Easter. And this week, what we're going to be doing is, for those that uh, can, we'll be meeting on Friday, this Friday, at the church between 11.30 and 12.30. For, uh, sorry, sorry, 10.30 till 11.30. We'll be, I'll scrub that part. <laughs> We'll be meeting at the church from 10.30 till 11.30, just giving God thanks, breaking bread together, and I think Bob's going to bring a short uh, word um, on the cross. Then, on Sunday, we're going to be looking at the resurrection of the Lord, Sunday morning and Sunday evening, we're going to have a Passover Seder together. Uh, so it's going to be a fantastic weekend. I really enjoyed Sunday, both morning and evening. It's a, fun, a fantastic day in the presence of the Lord with the saints of God. Please continue to pray for Kevin. Kevin is going in tomorrow uh, for a big scan. And we're going to continue to pray for Alicia, who's going in for a major operation this week. Um, Alicia is Joshua's wife in Australia, Viv's son. Um, she really needs our prayers at this time, so we're gonna to continue to pray for Alicia too. So what we're gonna to do to kick off is Mandy is going to read to us from Exodus chapter three, verses one to 10. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Wonderful. So we're going to be looking at some of the parallels between the two. Notice, by the way, it's God's presence that sanctifies a place. It's God's presence that makes a place holy. It wasn't the bush that was holy, it's God. And because God was in the, in the midst of the bush, if you like, Moses couldn't go any further, he had to take his shoes off. It's God's presence that makes the tabernacle holy. It's God's presence that makes the temple holy. It's God's presence that makes the Christian holy. It's God's presence that makes a gathering of Christians holy. It's always the presence of God that sanctifies the, the place. It's not the place itself. We get caught up with buildings and things. It's God's presence that, that sanctifies that place. I'm gonna get Mandy to read Exodus chapter 4, excuse me, um, verse 21 to 23. 
And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. Israel is my son, my firstborn, so I shall say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Okay, <laughs> so basically what we have here is Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh. We've already looked at this. We've looked at the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, and we see that he comes up against two magicians, and those magicians can counterfeit what Moses and Aaron are doing, it's, it's amazing. Personally, I believe that the other witness, Elijah's one of them, I'm pretty convinced that the other witness is Moses. That's just my own opinion there. But what we see is that there's this confrontation in Exodus with two witnesses against two witnesses. We see this confrontation in Revelation chapter 11. We've looked at that. It's all part of it. So what we see in Exodus replays itself again with the Jewish people in the last days. Here's another amazing thing. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh that to, to let them go that, so that they can go on a three-day mm. journey to make sacrifices to their God. Remember we looked in Hosea? After two days, he will revive them. On the third day, he will raise them up. Three days. Constantly, we see these three days coming up with Jonah in the belly of the whale. Three days, of course, for the Son of Man. Death, burial, resurrection. Three days, three days, three days. But um, I, th I think it's very, very interesting. The whole thing correlates. In the very last days, there'll be a period of three specific days in which the Lord intensifies, um, if you like, his, his presence amongst the remnant of the Jews and keeps bringing back to their remembrance the scriptures and how they, they drop together, which is what we're going to be doing at the end, or rather what you're going to be doing at the end. So um, Exodus chapter 5, Mandy, verses 1 to 8. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please, let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labour. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labour. So the same day Pharaoh, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Yeah, when we went to Auschwitz and you go under that gate and of course you've got the writing there work sets you free it's always the same thing so when god comes on the scene of course there's a there's an explosion in the population of the hebrews at that time there's the eugenics which we looked at on sunday morning with the killing of the male children and then enslaving the hebrews putting them making them do the the worst possible task slave labor and terrible persecution. This increases at the beginning. At the, the, the sign that God is going to redeem them and going to set them free, this hard labor and, the, um, and, and what Pharaoh does to them, first of all increases and of course uh, the people turn on Moses and Aaron because they don't believe it's going to happen. So we're just, we're reading now chapter six, verses seven to nine. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord the God, your God. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Yeah. 
it's really interesting that, that they're trying to get a way to worship Yahweh, the one true God. They Pharaoh will always have us making bricks of mud. He'll always find something for us to do. The God of this age I'm talking He's about busy. now. He will always start find useless things for us to do rather than going and worshipping the Lord. And we see more and more, and it tells us in Hebrews that we are to gather together more as we see the day approaching, but we all know what's happening. Um, in many places around the world, churches are emptying, they're not filling, particularly churches that used to be strong Bible-believing churches, they're falling to pieces at the moment. People are beginning to compromise. Pharaoh will always have you building useless building projects, making uh, uh, compacted mud bricks for him rather than going and worshipping the Lord. And, we, and, and there's the, I believe there's a life application in this for us all that we have to make time to meet with God. Even in this calamitous season that we find ourselves in where people are so busy, we have to make time to meet with God, particularly together. Okay, we're, we're looking at Revelation, ch Exodus chapter 7, verses 10 to 13. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his serpents, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the mag magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod, rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. I just think this is amazing, because in the last days in Revelation, you've got two Jewish witnesses in Jerusalem that, of course, are, are causing all kinds of signs and wonders to happen. In Revelation 13, we find that there's this counterfeit. There's so many parallels between Exodus and the book of Revelation. Now, in, um, just go to verse 20 to 23 of chapter 7, man. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. So of course this is the beginning of the ten plagues. But there's a beautiful verse in chapter 10, Mandy, if you want to turn to Exodus chapter 10. And we'll just read a section here, uh, Exodus 10 verses 21 to 26, where there's again a showdown between Moses and uh, Pharaoh. And there's something that Moses said that really reminds me of Jesus when Jesus says, no, not one of them will be snatched from my hand. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, and there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock shall also go, go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must, must serve the Lord when we, until we arrive there. So Moses says to Pharaoh, no, 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 not a hoof shall be left behind. Not a hoof shall be left behind. That is so beautiful. It reminds me of Jesus saying, nobody will snatch them out of my hand. And we looked at this, you know, in Revelation 12, 
that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, that we do not love our lives unto death, that our salvation in Jesus Christ is absolutely secure. The only way that we can possibly lose our salvation is by completely denying Jesus Christ, completely turning our back on him, and giving up the faith in him completely. That is the only way. That's the only way. And of course, taking the mark fulfills all of those things. To take the mark, it's a total denial of Jesus. It's turning your back on Jesus and it's giving up on the faith. And so our salvation in Christ is very secure. And as Jesus says, no one can snatch them from my hand. And as Moses says to Pharaoh, not a hoof shall be left behind. Beautiful. Okay, we're coming to the end. It's now time for us to do our homework. We've got Exodus 11, Mandy. Exodus 11, verses 1 to 3. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask from his neighbour and every woman from her neighbour articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So they have to, they ask for gold and silver, which is obviously going to be used. We see it later on in Exodus. It's going to be used for the building mm. of the tabernacle. So at the beginning, we see Moses coming to a bush, just a common Arcasia bush, probably. And God says, don't come any closer, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Later on, we see that Moses is saying, you tell Pharaoh to, you're going to go on a three-day journey for a feast to, to worship me. And here we see that he's saying to them, you tell the, to, to the Egyptians you want gold and silver and so on, you're going to take it with you. God always knew what the outcome was going to be. Isn't that beautiful? He always knew that the outcome would be that they would be set free from the slavery and the bondage of Egypt and that they would be taken out of that situation through the Red Sea. They'd come to Mount Sinai. They'd be given the Ten Commandments. The, the uh, Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle would be made. That house of forgiveness would be set up for the people of God. And all these things ultimately symbolise what's to come for the Jews, ultimately the Promised Land. God always knew what the outcome was going to be. Don't come any closer, Moses. This is holy ground. It's God that makes a place holy. And he took them out of that place. And of course, Gentile churches need to understand, more than they do understand, it, is that the table of the <laughs> Lord comes from Passover. Mm -hmm. It's not some Greek, Hellenistic, Gentile, Constantinian thing that we do. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the Roman Catholic Church or even the Reformation. It goes right the way back to Passover. The table of the Lord is the fulfillment, in essence, of Passover. It's where we come together and we remember what he did for us and how he set us free, not from Pharaoh this time, but from the slavery of sin and, and the oppression of Satan. Okay, then we get to Exodus 12. And Exodus 12, which is what Cynthia read on Sunday morning, Exodus 12, <laughs> 1 to 6, is where every family is to take a lamb and they're to become familiar with that lamb for um, four days. Let's have a read of that, Mandy. No, I don't matter about that. Exodus 12, 1 to 6. Now the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of her, his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. 
Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Mm. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Isn't this amazing how we see Jesus coming into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. He presents himself to Israel as the lamb. And for the next four days, we see right in the middle of Jerusalem, we see um, the people becoming familiar with the lamb before they go away and kill the lamb. It's the most incredible picture. So here's now the reading for the group. Um, I'd like you to read John chapter 12, verses 12 to 16. John 12, 12 to 16. This is when the Lamb comes in fulfilment of Exodus chapter 12. The Lamb coming to the houses, to the households, to the people. And then Luke chapter 19, verses 37 to 48. Of course, we looked at this a little bit on Sunday morning. You're going to you follow the guy that loses the, 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 the coat and the, the wash basin and so on and, and, um, and go into the house and you'll find that the house is furnished and ready. It's beautiful because just as it was back then, just as it was in Exodus, just as it was for the disciples, it's going to be like this for the Jews in the last days. The wilderness is going to be furnished for them. Everything is going to be set up for them and they're going to have their own kind of Passover remembrance in that wilderness during those three and a half years where all these scriptures are going to begin to make sense to them. So that's John 12, 12 to 16, Luke 19, 37 to 48. And then if you continue in Luke 19, 20 to 21. And then Luke 22, Luke 22, verses one to 16. 1 to 16. Now then, they had to become familiar with the Lamb. So we know what happens in Exodus. We know that the final judgment, which is the killing of the firstborn of all those in Egypt, anybody that didn't have the blood of the Lamb upon the doorpost of their house, the firstborn was taken from Pharaoh's palace to the slave. The firstborn was taken. We know at that point that Pharaoh let them go. But after he let them go, he became furious that he let them go. And hmm. all the armies uh, of the Egyptians pursue them. And they pursue them into a rocky alcove with rocks on one side, rocks on the other side, and a complete dead end with the Red Sea in front. Hmm. This is what we see in the last days. What will happen in the last days is that when the remnant flees, remember Matthew 24, flee to the mountains, Revelation chapter 12, flee to the wilderness that's prepared for you. Isaiah tells you it's going to be a rocky fortress. Isaiah also tells you it's going to be Bosra. Micah tells you it's going to be like a sheepfold. They're going to go into this place which they're going to be, it's going to be prepared for them by God, but there's going to come a point where the armies that we see gathered in Armageddon, when Jerusalem has been sacked and they've wiped out many Jewish people there, they're going to pursue um, the remnant to this region. Now, I can't prove this. This is just kind of me thinking off the top of my head. But in the same way that the Red Sea opened up and Pharaoh thinks, this is it. You know, now we can take them. The Red Sea opens up and they start to go through and the very last of the, uh, of the Hebrews are, are getting out the other end and God closes the sea on them. It appears that, it appears as you put scripture together, that there's an opportunity for the Antichrist armies. It's almost like Edom opens up. There's a way for them to go in. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that Jesus rides Remember, he treads the wine press alone. Where does he go to? <clears throat> he goes to Basra, and there's a great slaughter. So in the same way that they were rescued through the Red Sea, and they sing the Song of Moses, we've looked at the Song of Moses in Revelation, 
The same thing is going to happen to the Jews in the last days and they will sing the song of Moses. All of, it is so, so beautiful. Anyway, anyway, I want you to try and picture those times. Imagine if you're there. Imagine if you're one of the remnant of the Jewish people that whether it's through the New Testament scriptures or a culmination of the old and the new, that, you've, that you realise you've got to make your way to this place. A bit like the wise men had to make the way to Bethlehem, the star and all that. You know, there's a, the way's opened up, it's prepared for them. I want you, to, this is the homework part now, I want you to think about all the scriptures that this remnant have got to put together in their heads to make them realize that Jesus, who they call Gentile Jesus, remember? He's the Jesus for the Gentiles. You speak to Viv, Viv will tell you that the, 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 the Jewish people look at Jesus as kind of Gentile. Somehow, somehow, in that wilderness, for a period of about three and a half years, they have to accept that their Messiah turned his attention to the Gentile nations for 2,000 years. They have to come to terms with that. They have to come to terms with the fact that it's not two Messiahs, mm. the Messiah that comes in like Joseph and the one that comes like the son of David, but there's one Messiah with two comings. The first time he comes to suffer and die, the second time he comes as the king to reign from Jerusalem and of course to, 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 to set up his kingdom forever. But here's the thing, during that time they've got to, they have to begin to understand these things. Wait a minute, he was the Messiah to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. They're going to have to rethink the scriptures, mm. many of them. And they will. So here's the, here's the homework for you guys. Think of scriptures. You need to use typology as well here. Yeah. I'm giving you a few clues here. Well, let me give you a, a tiny little clue. Joseph <laughs> would be a tiny little clue to use typology as well. And even Midrash to put together this picture that they're going to have to put together and come to terms with in this place to realize that their Messiah is also the Messiah mm -hmm. to the entire Gentile world and that he had to suffer and die the way that he did. They're looking, still looking for a conquering king. They are. Yeah. So they're going to have to bring all these things together and they will. So that's the homework. That's the homework, guys. Try and think of the scriptures, whether it's prophecy, or whether it's typology, try and draw them together and think it through. Try and imagine that your little house group are part of that remnant that have gone into Petra and you're trying to work out how does this all fit together? Could the Jesus of the Gentiles be our Christ? Put the scripture together, friends, and see what you can come up with. I promise you, as you do it, you, the Lord will bless you. You will experience a tremendous blessing. If, if we do it right, we put the effort in, your, your group will experience a tremendous blessing. And what a way to move into Passover this week. And um, like I say, Sunday evening, we're going to be looking at what the Jewish people, or a, a mini version of how the Jewish people would celebrate Passover. So if you're free Friday, 10.30 till 11.30, we're going to um, come together in the church. Praise the Lord. Break bread together. Bob's going to bring a short gospel message. And Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Sunday evening, we're going to be having a Passover Seder together. It's good to be alive when you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, isn't it? It's good. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Anyway, it's good. It's good night from me and it's good night from her. <laughs> good night.